Welcome back to the Trans Atheist with your host, Ariane. You can hear my birds in the background, and I'm afraid it's going to probably be a noisy one because, well, the sun's up and the birds are, the wild birds are in the front yard. So, um, while I kind of lightly mentioned this in previous podcasts, today I want to talk about the SCOTUS ruling, uh, and we're going to focus in on that on um, abortion, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Of course, a lot of us had kind of seen this one coming, and we were waiting to see if the ruling changed any, which it didn't. Uh, This was the worst-case scenario kind of ruling. It was very, you know, there were thoughts that maybe Roberts would sway the court to do a very limited overturning of Roe v. Wade, maybe on, you know, allow the Mississippi or Alabama, I'm trying to remember which law, which one it was that came before it, but allow it to stand without tearing down all of Roe v. Wade. But in this case, they did tear down all of Roe v. Wade, and we're already seeing the implications of that. A 10-year-old here in Ohio, um, a rape victim, who was pregnant, was unable to get an abortion because she was six weeks and three days pregnant. And Ohio has this ignorant heartbeat bill that worked like a trigger law going directly into effect after the ruling that made six weeks kind of the cutoff point. But kind of what I wanted to talk about, as a trans woman, some people may be confused as to why this matters to me. Because obviously, as a trans woman, my ability to get pregnant is exactly zero. I would also point out that there are a large number of women out there who are not trans who also don't have the ability to be pregnant. That doesn't stop us from being women. Just as I am concerned about racism and the impact on people of color, despite the fact that I am not a person of color. Compassion, understanding, and even a lot of righteous indignation doesn't have to be based solely on the fact that you're the person directly impacted. But I'd also point out that as trans people, as LGBT people, We are impacted by this ruling in a lot of ways. Number one, every human in the United States is impacted when we keep in mind that the firm foundation of Roe v. Wade was bodily autonomy. The rights to control your own body. When that's torn away in any aspect, when we undermine bodily autonomy... That is an issue for all of us. And we're seeing bodily autonomy come up in other ways with things like um, the transphobic uh, bills that are going across states to pull trans health care from anyone under the age of 18. And I've seen some places propose 21. So there are a lot of things to look at. Also, when it comes right down to this, it impacts everyone because the basis on which we are seeing this happen in the United States is theocracy. So this is not based on science, and I'm not going to argue with you about when a fetus becomes a baby or... or, Because ultimately, at the end of the day, I don't think that matters. It could be a human baby at day one, you know, when the sperm meets the egg. That does not matter because the point of all of this, again, goes back to bodily autonomy and who gets to control that woman's body. Does she get to control her own body? Or does some outside or even inside agent have the right to control it? So if we think about the issue of rape, for example. And I'm not making an analogy about like why why there should be an exception for rape or incest. I think there should be exceptions for, well, frankly, everything. But if we look at the issue of rape, what is the difference between rape and just a regular sexual encounter? 
Well, the difference in that case is consent. So we understand that if a married couple decides that they want to have sex, that is a perfectly fine, ordinary, and even pleasant experience. On the other hand, if someone is raped, we see that as a horrible experience. The same general act took place. What was different was that one in one scenario, two people were not consenting to that interaction. So when we look at pregnancy, when a person wants to be pregnant, wants to have a child, that is a happy scenario and that individual has given consent to the pregnancy. However, just like with the case of rape and that woman has, or, or person I should say to be more appropriate, has every right to end that encounter, to do everything they can to stop it, to evict the rapist from their body. The same becomes true when we're talking about a pregnancy. This woman did not consent. This person did not consent. And in this case, they have the right to terminate the pregnancy. It is not about taking a life. That just happens to be a side effect of it. But that fetus doesn't have a right to the body without the pregnant person's consent. Now, if we want to go to the extreme and make it about, well, the life of the fetus, or as they would say, the life of the child, then we run into some very serious problems because here's a little fact for you. When you give birth to a child and that child is now in the world, what happens if they have an incurable illness and you, as the parent, are the one person that can make a donation of an organ or tissue or blood. Can the government force you to do so? Well, here's a the fact. They can't. They cannot force you on a living, breathing, outside of the uterus baby to donate an organ or blood or tissue to that child even if it means that the child will otherwise die. So what we're talking about with these anti-abortion laws is a special right because the right that any other human has, the right that that born living, breathing child has, or in this case doesn't have, that fetus does have. So that fetus can demand by their standard that you must do so. They can demand that you must give everything to the fetus. But they don't do the same thing in regards to a living, breathing child. You know, if we look at the issue of rape, we put people away in prison. Some states even have it as a capital offense, all based on the age of the victim, for forcing themselves for not receiving consent for a sexual encounter. That's a violation of bodily autonomy, and yet we are telling women in the United States, we are telling people with uteruses, people who can become pregnant, that your bodily autonomy does not matter for a minimum of nine months. We have the full control to decide. And the issue becomes how we're going to actually enforce this that is where it gets even more frightening. What are they going to do? If a woman crosses state lines and gets an abortion in another state, is she now guilty of a crime in her home state? If I drive somebody to another state, am I now an accomplice to quote-unquote murder? If someone has a miscarriage, do we now treat them as a suspect until such time that we can prove that the miscarriage happened naturally. You know, there are so many issues with this, not to mention the 10-year-olds, the 12-year-olds that are the victims of sexual assault and a pregnancy results from that, having no option. Do you know what legal contract a 10 or a 12-year-old can enter into? Not a damn one. 
They cannot buy a car. They cannot have a credit card. They are not allowed to smoke or drink. They are not allowed, technically, if you go by the law, you know, we can hold someone accountable if they're having a sexual relationship with someone of that age. They can be put in prison as they rightfully should. They are not allowed to adopt a child. They are not allowed to foster a child. And yet the government says, we will force you to become a parent, even in cases where you made no decision at all in this process. We also have entopic pregnancies. Those unfortunately ignorant white men who continue to write these laws seem to know nothing about that. But an entopic pregnancy is when the fetus, when the egg implants inside the fallopian tube as opposed to, you know, in the uterus. And in 100% of cases, outside of medical intervention, that is a deadly situation for the pregnant individual. And what is the treatment for that? It's an abortion. It's the removal of that egg that has already been fertilized and may even be to the point of what we would call a fetus in the early stages. And no, unlike some dumbass politicians have said, there is no way to re-implant an entopic pregnancy. So what we are looking at right now are people dying. People, pregnant people in our states, especially in the states that are enacting these draconian laws, they will die. Who won't die? Well, the politicians' wives, the politicians' you know, mistresses, the ultra-wealthy who can afford to fly themselves out of state should they need it. All of these cases they will be just fine. But middle class and poor people, people who have no political clout, these are people that ultimately these laws want to throw in prison in a nation that has one of the highest incarceration rates in the modern westernized world. And what do we want to put people in prison for? We want to put them in prison for saving their own lives. We want to put them in prison for making a determination about their own body. We want to put them in prison because when another organism decided it was going to take up residence in their body and they were not willing to accept that, they ejected that organism. And for that, we have determined that they are deserving of prison. This is a problem in our country. It impacts us regardless of whether you have the ability to become pregnant or not. This is a religious move. There is no secular justification for these anti-abortion laws. They do, it does not exist. The argument of when a life begins is an absolute useless argument. It doesn't damn well matter. You can argue all day long about at exactly what point a fetus becomes a human baby. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we already have a human, a fully functional human, as part of this conversation. They are already here. They are the one carrying this fetus regardless of whether we want to call it a child or debate its current stature in life, we already have a human entitled to equal protection under the law, entitled to bodily autonomy regardless of what a bunch of idiots in black robes who want to turn our Supreme Court into a high church council think about it. And we have to be willing to fight for that. But let me tell you my thoughts on this. We have the Senate that has talked about passing a law to codify Roe v. Wade. 
And while I think that is an important step, I think that at the end of the day, that will ultimately be useless. And here's my reasoning why. Because if that law were passed codifying Roe v. Wade, then you're going to have a state like Texas that's going to challenge it because it will conflict with their law. And who do they challenge that to? Ultimately, they're going to challenge it up to the Supreme Court. A Supreme Court that we have no reason whatsoever to trust. So that is our problem. That is the issue we are in. That until we fix the Supreme Court, everything else is window dressing. It may work for a very short period of time while a case moves through the court system. But ultimately, this court has made it very clear that they will ignore precedent. They will ignore the rule of law. And yes, they will damn well even ignore the United States Constitution in order to institute their new judicial philosophy, which is apparently, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm not all that concerned with that. As an atheist, I don't care what you think a particular religious figure would do. I don't care what Zeus would do. I don't care what Poseidon would do. I don't care what Jesus or Yahweh or Allah or Vishnu or Krishna. I don't care what they would do. I care about the civil rights, the bodily autonomy of living, breathing, thinking humans. And that has to be our focus right now. And we have to fix our court to where they are once again interpreting our Constitution rather than making bullshit claims whole cloth. That is why this is an important issue. It's an important issue because I may be a trans woman, but every single one of us came from a person who had the ability to give birth. A person whose life could have ended before we were ever born had they been raped and dealt with a difficult pregnancy at a young age, had they had an entopic pregnancy before us. I have a friend whose mother has dealt with multiple entopic pregnancies. She has multiple children. She would not have those children had it not been for the availability of abortion care because those entopic pregnancies that were never going to become a human baby would have already killed her before she had the opportunity to give birth to them. There are real consequences for what is going on right now. This is draconian. It is despicable. It is a disgusting return to a time period when the medical procedure involved a back alley and a coat hanger. And we need to be better than this. We need to learn, we need to move forward, and we got to keep fighting like hell. So to my cisgender sisters who have the ability to give birth, to my trans brothers who have a uterus and the ability to give birth, to every person, I am with you, I stand fully by you, and trans women, we will stand with you, the entire LGBT community, because we know what it's like to be treated as subhuman ourselves. We understand the thought process here that just like rape is seldom about sex, this law is seldom about life. Both of them are about control. And this is what we see here. A controlling court a controlling religious doctrine and theocracy, creeping theocracy coming to take over this country. They have started here with abortion. They, are, they have done and already weakened the separation of church and state for years, but even in recent cases. And I can assure you, my LGBT people, they are coming for us. We have to stand united and know that we are, in fact, stronger together. And while they talk about making this country, you know, make America great again, well, we're not there right now, but you want to know the real people 
who are going to make America great, not again, but for the first time. It's the activists. It's the women out there marching, the trans, non-binary, gay, lesbian, bisexual, asexual, demi, every group that understands the black and brown people who, are pro who have protested against police brutality. We are the ones who make this nation great. We make this nation great because we call it out when it's not great. We tell it to be better. We demand change and we never give up until we see that change enacted. Fight like hell and absolutely we will win. It's going to be rough days ahead, but we've got to keep fighting until we see that finish line. Anyway, that was today's episode of The Trans Atheist with your host, Arian. Hopefully you will come back for more episodes. If you have an idea, a comment, a suggestion, please feel free to send it to me. Whatever platform you're listening to this from should have a comment section, which I can typically see. Um, you can also, um, if you look on the YouTube channel, which there's a link, um, I will have an email address listed there that you will also be able to send any comments or you can leave it in the comment section below. And thank you. I will see, well, here, talk to you again very soon in the next podcast. Bye-bye.